right, James Nestor, I'm thrilled to welcome you to Better with Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. And um, we are going to talk about your book. I know it came out last year, uh, Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art. And I wanted to actually start uh, at the start, uh, I was telling you in the pre-chat, one of the things that really grabbed me about this book was that we find you in this like Amityville horror type of, you know, Victorian, uh, you know, free breathwork class. And I would love for us to just to set a little bit of the stage for what we're going to talk about today, talk about what uh, you know, walk us through what happened, um, and how that was potentially one of, I mean, we'll talk about your history and your, uh, you know, your previous books and such, but what was, I think potentially one of the catalysts for this book, what happened that day and what was your experience? Well, the personal experience was one of the catalysts for the book, but it was one of many, actually. I had been interested in breathing for for years and years. I had had a number of chronic breathing issues that I was told were completely normal and were just part of growing old, which was depressing for me to consider, but that's what I was reassured about. I didn't really go for that. I thought that there might be some deeper underlying problem to my breathing, but I didn't know what it was. What were your breathing issues? Sorry to interrupt you. What were your breathing issues? Oh, sure. So I was getting bronchitis all the time. I was getting mild pneumonia uh, once a year. Uh, One year I got it twice and, you know, I was given a Z pack and told to go on my way and uh, it worked. Antibiotics work, work for that kind of stuff. But I was more curious as a science journalist of why, why was I, getting sick? Why was I having trouble breathing? Why was I wheezing when I was working out? Uh, Why at night was my mouth always very dry? Why would I wake up coughing? And nobody seemed to really have a good answer for this. Not even doctors that I talked to. So finally, a doctor friend suggested I check out a breathing class, which here in San Francisco, there are many of these things. And I went down and did this breathing class. And the first time I did it, I was like, "Eh, it was okay. I'm not sure what this is going to do for my lung function. But then uh, this was probably months later or or several weeks later, I did a follow-up class and really had a profound reaction to it, which brought to me so many other questions of, of what breathing could really do for the body, how it could transform the body, how it could heat the body, even heal the body. And as a science journalist, I didn't want to write about my personal experience at all. I wanted to understand the real medical science behind this stuff and try to get a better view of where breathing could take us. And your, your reaction was not mild. It was, you had completely soaked through your clothes. And I remember, I recall when I was reading the book, uh, you commenting, like, how am I going to bike home? Like, how am I going to get home from this? Because I'm completely like, as if it's as if I've already run a marathon and I still have, you know, a ways to, to get home. Yeah. Um, without getting into the nitty gritty details, I sweated so profusely that I sweated through my t-shirt. My hair was sopping wet. Uh, there were sweat stains on my jeans. Other people saw this in, in the class. And this was by sitting in a corner of a cold room in wintertime in San Francisco and breathing in a rhythmic pattern after about 15 minutes. And it was a sweat I'd never experienced before. And again, as a, as a journalist, uh, I didn't want to write about that personal experience, I was like, what the hell happened to me? How is this possible? And I went and asked a number of doctors. There's doctors in my family. I know a number of doctors. Nobody had a good explanation. They said, oh, you must have been wearing too many clothes. Oh, you had a fever. Uh, Oh, you shouldn't sit in a hot room, you know, because you're going to sweat too much. So they came up with these explanations because they didn't know what happened. And I'm not even sure they really believe me. And so that's what really got me curious. I wanted to figure that out for myself. And if breathing just in this rhythmic pattern can elicit such a profound physiological response in just a few minutes, what else can it do? Where else can it bring us? And that's kind of what set me on my way. Right. And this is, you know, I, I mentioned uh, the, the first question was one of many catalysts. And, um, you know, your previous 
uh, book was all about free diving and, you know, how we have seemingly superhuman powers to take one breath and then to dive to these depths that humans are not really supposed to uh, be able to do. So maybe before we kind of go on with the book, I think maybe a li- let's maybe move backward just for a moment and talk a little bit about what some of your observations were observing some of these free divers and your own personal um Uh, your own personal experience with free diving as well. So maybe a little context around what free diving is and then what were some of your observations around that as well? So as luck would have it, these experiences kept stacking up in pretty quick succession. So after I had had this experience in this breathing class, probably three or four months, maybe five months after that, I was put on an an assignment by Outside Magazine to write about the world free diving championship, which is a competition in which divers challenge one another to see how deep they can dive on a single breath of air and come back to the surface conscious. If that sounds like a bad idea, it's because it is. But (laughs) uh, I, I went out to Greece after having had my own experience with breathing and saw some of the best breathers in the world. So I saw people who could hold their breath for five, six, seven, eight minutes at a time. I saw people that could take a single breath and dive down to depths of 350 feet on a single breath of air, disappear into the ocean, come back up. Uh, It completely blew my mind. The competitive side of free diving, I wasn't too interested in Um, seeing who could dive deeper, seeing who couldn't pass out, seeing who wouldn't die coming back. That seemed pretty crazy to me. But the other side of using free diving, using your natural breath as a way to connect with the ocean, to do this in a very harmonious way to do this in a respectful way to use it as a meditation as a yoga practice that really appealed to me so that was the beginning of my first book deep which looks at the human connection to the ocean from the surface to the very bottom of the deepest sea so at the surface is where the free diving is in that book and i became a free diver myself not a competitive free diver that's not what interests me but learning how to really harness the power of my breath and so After that whole process of years of writing that book and researching it, I thought that there was a much larger story to be told about breathing. My agent didn't agree. My editor didn't agree. They thought this was a terrible idea. But after a few years of of pretty hard research, uh, they came around. And it's it's interesting, too, when you think about, um, you know, the ocean at some point, um, you know, call it maybe 20, 30 feet it doesn't push you back up to the surface anymore. At, at that point, it starts to kind of pull you, pull you in. And uh, you talk about this idea of um, sort of these animals coming up to you and being like, hey, you're, you know, one of us. And that sort of meditative connection uh, to, you know, Mother Earth and all of her and all of her, you know, species, which I think was um, beautiful. And again, one of the one of the different um uh, catalyst that brought you to write uh, breath. So you yourself became a free diver. So what were some of the, what were your observations? What were some of your personal experiences from that? Yeah. So I, you know, I really try to stay out of my books and out of my writing. That's going to seem uh, comedic to people who have read the books, uh, but I never intend to be a part of any of these books. I'm actually pretty opposed to that because it always bothers me, especially in nonfiction when an author keeps inserting himself or like, herself. Thanks for the end of story. one. I appreciate that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I, it, and, and, but with the free diving book, I kept seeing these people having these incredible experiences with sharks, with dolphins, with whales. And they said, if you really want to understand this, you have to learn how to do this. But I had a hang up about it because I had seen the competitive side of free diving. That was my introduction to it. I said, I don't want to do this. This looks insane. But bit by bit, you know, foot by foot, breath by breath, I was able to get myself to really relax and understand that free diving doesn't need to be this daredevil thing that's been sold to us in newspapers, the sensationalist activity. It can be the most nourishing meditative and calming thing for anyone who has seen my octopus teacher that is free diving everybody i'm so happy that that movie became so big because it shows what free diving is really about and the access it can give you both to these reflexes within our bodies but also 
to other oceanic life. Yeah, beautiful. So let's let's come back to your book. Um, at the beginning, you and uh, your friend Anders decide to run this experiment, which would never be approved by an IRB, uh, which was what would happen if you stopped nasal breathing altogether? And I would um, love for you to walk us through what you measured and some of the attempts at control as well. So I know that there was, you know, you were trying to keep your ADLs, your activities of daily living fairly consistent, you know, pre experiment to, you know, when you had everything uh, plugged up and your, you know, physical activity, your performance, that sort of thing. So walk us through how you convinced yourself and your friend to do this. And then what were some of the, what were some of the, um, walk us through what the experiment was. So it was never me convincing myself or, or Anders to do this. Awesome. From several conversations I had had with Dr. Jack or Nyack, who is the chief of rhinology research at Stanford. I live in San Francisco. Stanford's pretty close. They have an incredible medical library. They have incredible researchers there. So I am constantly in contact with, with the people down there. And I found Nyack. Um, he was kind enough to agree to do an initial interview because he didn't know what I was working on. I didn't understand really the intricacies of nasal breathing. He's I would consider a world expert in this. So we had one lunch that led to another lunch, led to another lunch. We got to really know one another. I got to know his research. And the more I learned about what he was doing, and he's a big nose guy, and he knows the power of nasal breathing. He deals with this every day. And he also knows the deleterious effects of mouth breathing. And this is well established in scientific literature. We've known this for 100 years. Breathing through the mouth is really bad for you. It's bad for uh, your mental capacity. It's bad for your lungs. It's bad for oxygenation. It's bad for so much else. But when I asked Nyack, I said, have there ever been any human trials comparing mouth breathing to nasal breathing? And he said, no, there have been monkey trials, uh, which are terrible, uh, terrible things to, to read where they would plug up monkeys for two years at a time and watch how their faces, their, their skeleture would actually change. Watch how their airways would change. Watch how their health would deteriorate. But no one had ever done this with humans. He said that he didn't want to do it because of ethical concerns. So I mentioned to Nyack, I said, well, what if somebody volunteered for an experiment? And he said, well, who would do that? I said, well, I'll, I'll do it if no one else is going to do it. And I thought it would be much more interesting to have at least two people. And so I called up Anders Olsen, who is a Swedish breathing expert, a big fan of nasal breathing. He's been writing about it and talking about it for years and years. And I said, you know, let's put your money where your mouth is. Come on out to San Francisco for a month and we'll do this experiment. I was kind of joking when, when I called him. He agreed to do it. So since NIAC, this wasn't an official study through Stanford, we had to pay for the entire study all the experiment, uh, which was not cheap at Stanford. Uh, we got a whole suite of different instruments here in my house. We had a home lab. Nyack was kind enough to allow us to use his lab, all of his instruments. We did pulmonary function tests. We did so much blood work. We did um, three times a day. We were measuring our CO2, our O2, our cognitive abilities, our weights, our balance, on and on and on. And so the way the experiment was set up is for 10 days, we were going to be obstructed. Uh, our noses were going to be obstructed, just breathing through our mouths, 100% through our mouths. And then for another 10 days, we were going to focus on just breathing through our noses as often as we could. And I know that this seems like a super size me trick or stunt, but we didn't view it as that. And neither did NIAC. The fact that, you know, 50% of the population is habitually mouth breathing and 15% has chronic sinusitis, another 10% has rhinitis. We have inflamed terminates on and on. So a huge percentage of the population is mouth breathing all the time anyway. So in many ways, we were just lulling ourselves into a position that so many people already knew the difference was we were measuring it every day to see what would happen to us. 
And there was a point, I think maybe towards the end of the experiment, Anders was going for a walk in the neighborhood and got <laughs> lost. Oh, it's a num- numerous times. Uh, that was about three days in. Our sleep suffered so severely, so quickly. The very first night, we both started suffering from, from snoring. We had taken two weeks of baseline, no snoring, no sleep apnea. Uh, we started snoring more and more the longer the experiment went on. Uh, we started suffering from sleep apnea as well. We were so out of it. Athletic performance uh, sunk precipitously. Um, our, our mental capacity was, was greatly diminished. I mean, it's just, and, and to be clear, we didn't prove anything with this experiment with a two person N two experiment. You're not going to prove anything. What we were doing was just supporting what science has already known for decades and decades. We were personally experiencing this. And so what were, so at the end of the 10 days, you make it to the end of the 10 days. And then what were, uh, so they take the, uh, the blockage out and now you're trying to nasal breathe as often as you can. What were some of the changes first, I think from, uh, the beginning of the experiment through to the 10 days, you'd mentioned a few of them, uh, you know, sleep apnea and snoring and cognitive, uh, you know, the cognitive map, at least for Anders to, you know, to get lost, to be so sleep deprived, to sort of be disoriented. Were there any, uh, changes in, um, oxygen saturation rate, blood pressure, heart rate thing, you know, what we would consider more vital, vital signs, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, VO two math, things like, things mm-hmm. like that. Heart rate was much increased, uh, stress levels, heart rate variability was, was terrible mouth breathing, uh, oxygen levels were fine because you get plenty of oxygen, but CO2 levels were very low. And that's, that's the problem. You need a balance of CO2 and oxygen for oxygen to do its thing. So our CO2 levels, when you breathe through the mouth, you tend to off gas a lot more CO2, uh, which can cause vasoconstriction and so many other circulation problems, which is why people who mouth breathe and over breathe tend to have cold hands and cold feet is <laughs> because they're not getting circulation to those areas. So a whole laundry list of issues, not everything changed. You know, we wore continuous blood glucose monitors and that we didn't see much of a change there. My blood pressure was very, very high mouth breathing. And within a day of nasal breathing, it went down about 12 points, 15 points, and just kept going down from there. So I want to be clear that my personal experience, I'm not going to say what happened to me is going to happen to everybody. Right. Right. Um, We, what we were doing again was seeing uh, personally experiencing what science has already known about the different pathways of breathing air. Um, And it's something entirely different to read a paper and then to really feel this stuff happening in your own body. And I think if more people played around with the different pathways through which they breathe air, they would know what a profound difference it makes to their mental clarity, to their athletic performance and more. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things, uh, one of the through lines of the book really is talking about some of the changes, the facial changes, the muscular changes, the skeletal changes that can happen in the face as a consequence of long-term, um, mouth breathing. Um, there's, you know, there's a term for it, you know, we call, I, I think it's called like adeno- adenoid face. Uh, okay. so uh, when, you know, when the tonsils are inflamed and you, you're changing the, uh, the amount of air or space that you have to actually pull the air in and for, for there to be, um, room for the, you know, for you to be, the sinus is not, you know, the palate is not encroaching into the, into the, uh, the sinus. So talk, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the changes that long-term mouth breathing can impart? I think it really starts in infancy. So there have been a number of studies and scientists have been talking about this for more than a hundred years. It's fascinating to, to look at this old research um, about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding and how that affects skeletal development, how that affects the face. When a child is breastfed um, every two hours or however often that they are feeding, it tends to pull the face out and it expands the upper palate of the mouth. So that child is going to have a different profile and and actually a different face in a wider airway, Uh, which is why kids who have been breastfed for two years are going to have less of a chance of having snoring and sleep apnea later on in life because they have a wider airway. That's, that's well established, but beyond that, 
it it really goes into oral posture and and chewing and this is something that modern humans are so bad at doing we hardly chew food anymore our ancestors used to chew for three or four hours a day and we chew hardly at all because almost all of our food is soft so without chewing especially in early development the face isn't going to go grow properly the bones aren't going to grow properly the musculature isn't going to grow properly so what often happens is the mouth will grow narrow and you will have something called a v-shaped palate I'm a great example of this as are most modern humans where that upper palate tends to grow up instead of out and when that happens, it can block the sinus passages. And that also makes your mouth so small that when your teeth grow in, they grow in crooked. So this sounds like crazy pseudoscience nonsense. I get it. It sounded crazy to me as well. Until you look at ancient skulls and you see that all of our ancestors had perfectly straight teeth and they had very flat, wide upper palates. And with that wide upper palate, and that straight teeth and that large mouth, it makes it easier to breathe. So it's, it's there in plain sight. It's been there the whole time, but this was the first time I'd ever heard about this stuff when I started researching this book. It's interesting. I breastfed uh, both my children, uh, first baby for about two years, second baby, three and a half. Um, and then their, their first foods were, um, you know, I cooked meat and like kind of chopped it up into little pieces so they could like, you know, take it and, and, um, put it in their mouth. But even in, and my children now are almost 11 and nine and even in their, uh, you know, life. I've also, I've seen the pediatric recommendations for food change. So their first foods were, uh, I think maybe their first food was like a butternut squash and then it was meat. And now it's don't give them meat. Like it's, it's, you know, give them the, 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 you know, the Gerber baby, like the applesauce and the pear, this, and the, and, you know, not poo-pooing on any particular brand, but my kids had to work with that meat. Like they had to chew it and they had to, they had to work with it and like kind of developing the the strength through the face, the masseter muscles, et cetera, um, to be able to get that food in. And we actually, um, didn't give them food right away. We sort of delayed it. They were eight or nine months when we first started giving them more solid food, but they had, to, they were so interested in it that they would just kind of chew and then like, you know, and then, and we would see them swallowing. But it's interesting that, um, even in the last 11 years, when my son went from breastfeeding to solid foods, that we've also seen a change in their recommendations now where they don't recommend that they give, that we give our children meat. Um, yeah. And that might, that might be a bit of a political uh, issue, but I think that meat is one of the best ways that you can actually develop the face because when you're having steamed apples or steamed vegetables that are very, very soft, it doesn't really take a lot of work in the mouth in order. It's just sort of like, you know, taste it with the tongue and then kind of throw it back. So the first thing I want to mention is I'm a dude. And so the last thing I'm going to do is make judgments uh, as to whether or not someone is breastfeeding or not. Like I was, of my, course. When, when I, and so you, you can speak to this, but this isn't why I'm mentioning this stuff. I'm just mentioning the science and the data. You know, I was, my mom said, Oh, you were breastfed for six months back then. That was a lot. Right. Nobody was doing this. She had three <laughs> kids, you know, how should, how could she possibly do this? So, so I just want to make that perfectly clear. There's no shaming on anyone for anything. I'm just and you're not telling mansplaining you, it. You're not no, mansplaining it. No, to I certainly no, I hope it. I'm not. No, but, but you know, about these different dietary recommendations, it's just, it astounds me that modern humans are, are so arrogant to think that we have just in the past few years figured out nature. We figured out nutrition. We're like, Oh, all these people who did this thing in this certain way, they were all wrong. Only we are right because we have crunched some certain numbers in some different way. You can go right now into any indigenous culture that is not eating Western food. Okay. Everybody has perfectly straight teeth. 
Okay. They don't have chronic respiratory issues. They don't have chronic sinusitis. They don't have allergies. They don't have asthma. They don't have hypertension. They don't have heart disease. Um, and you go into modern society where people are following these new regulations and look what happens. All of these diseases are epidemics. So uh, this is something called ancestral health. I just went to a conference on it at UCLA. And, and so it, it just makes you think in a more long-term way about health and who is right. Um, and I would be very apprehensive of any dietary guidelines that suggested that we continue eating processed, canned, bottled foods. Um, that's not what our ancestors did. That's not what these hunter-gatherer tribes are currently doing right now. And you can see what these foods, what these modern foods have done to us. Uh, they've devastated our health. Well, it's kind of the same as, as tummy time, right? Like ba my babies hated tummy time, but they had to work at it in order to gain that muscular strength in the erector spinae group and in the neck muscles in order to be able to lift their head and then pan their head across the horizon. But it was work, you know, in the same way that developing, you know, the, um, uh, the muscles in the face requires work. Like your masseters, it's like use it or lose it. It's like any muscle in the body. It's a exactly skeletal right. muscle. If you're not using it, it's going to atrophy. And this, it kind of brings me to maybe a bit of, um, maybe more controversy, but um, I want to talk a little bit about modern dentistry and, and, orthodont and orthodontics, because what we see now, of course, is with the modern uh, recommendations as they are, where we have the processed foods, the softer foods, the lack of mastication. We are now engaging in things like braces. Um, I'm sure there's other things that I'm not thinking of, but, you know, pa you know, maybe palate expanders would be maybe a airing on the better side of, you know, a good intervention, but generally braces when we're seeing crooked teeth, when there's not enough room in the, in the mouth and the, the teeth are all coming in crooked is that, based on the data that you've seen, is that a root cause approach or are we missing the mark? Hmm. So this is a very controversial subject and I will just stand back here a bit and throw out a caveat that I'm a reporter. So I just go out and I talk to people and I read scientific papers and I try to get a story. And, and I'm not heard, a doctor and you don't I'm play one on TV. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. I'm not a breathing therapist. If you want someone to run you through some breathing exercises, I'm not the guy. <laughs> I'm the person who was trying to write about what breathing does to the body, where it comes from, why it works so effectively. So that's that's my role as a journalist. But I thought that this stuff about the mouth and dentistry was so fascinating. And now I'm pretty pretty deep in this field. I've been speaking at a number of dental conferences, which is so ironic that a journalist would be talking to dentists about dentistry, but it is what it is. So it all comes down to the core problem of crooked teeth. What is the core problem of crooked teeth? It's a mouth that is too small for your face. That's the problem. When a mouth grows so small, teeth have nowhere to grow in. So they fight for room and they grow in crooked. That's it. So the way that we've approached crooked teeth since the 1940s is we've taken this mouth that's too small for its face and we've removed teeth and taken those remaining teeth and crunched them back. So you're making a small mouth smaller. And we're doing this to kids who are in stages of very quick development. So it's, you can almost think of it as like foot binding, right? When you wrap your feet up when you're young, so your feet don't grow big. This is what we're doing to mouths. So the rest of the head grows, but the mouth is constrained to be too small. So that creates beautiful teeth, right? We're walking around now, most of us with braces and headgear and I had all that crap. We have great teeth, but the consequences of that is you have constricted the development of the mouth, which means you have created an airway that is smaller than it could be or should be, which can cause so many chronic issues later on down the line. 
And even just the side profile, like you'll see the chin is sort of retracted relative to the nose. You'll have underbites, overbites. And then again, it doesn't really solve the issue of making the palate wider. And I think it uh, might've been in your book or might've been in my research, I can't recall which one, but you had you had tried a device uh, to help with chewing. Um, are, are there alternatives potentially, or maybe things that can work in conjunction uh, with uh, braces where we can be working to expand the palate, like a palate expander, uh, something of that nature where we might be working to actually get to the problem, which causes the crooked teeth, which is not enough room in the mouth. So as I mentioned, I had braces and, and had gear and retainers and, and all of that. And when they took a CAT scan of my head, they said, um, and they were looking at everything. These dentists were, they said, yeah, you, of course you have this retracted retronathic profile because of what happened to, uh, to how, how you were treated, um, with, with braces and headgear and all that. Is there another control of me that didn't have that, that we could compare? There's not, there isn't, which is why this stuff gets, gets a little tricky, but be that as it is, I'm stuck with what I have now. And I wanted to see what someone who is an adult could, could do. Is there any way to improve these problems that we've been plagued with, you know, including our airways, constricted airways? So as a curious person, as a reporter, I tried out some of these methods. I used a retainer at night to help expand my palate. This sounds kind of gnarly. It's really not. There's a suture that goes right in the middle of the palate that can open at any stage of life. And so the what this retainer was trying to do was to gently expand that palate to help open up my airways. I also started chewing really hard gum and I took a CAT scan a year before and a year after uh, chewing gum and using this retainer. And I gained something like 15 to 20% more space in my airways. And I haven't had a stuffy nose since then. Uh, again, does that prove anything? One person? Uh, it doesn't. But we, there are so many different case studies and, and several actual scientific studies showing that palatal expansion can significantly improve airway issues from sleep apnea to ADHD and more. And again, this sounds crazy, but if you think about it, if someone is struggling to breathe every moment of their life, right, 20,000, 25,000 breaths a day, that's going to have a downstream effect on their health. You have to remove that obstruction. And so by expanding a too small mouth, this can be one of the ways you can do that. Right. And especially when we think about our, our beautiful kids, of course, they're anabolic, right? They're all, there's like the cell turnover. And I would, I would imagine that these types of intermittent, like the palate expander for our children, um, is going to help, um, you know, eradicate maybe, uh, at maybe attenuate the frequency with which we require braces. We have uh, the thing ADHD and bedwetting and all of these different things that we see as a result of this smaller mouth uh, it, size. It's absolutely transformative to kids' health. Okay. Especially for kids who are suffering from sleep apnea or who are snoring or who are struggling to breathe. I've spoken with many pediatric dentists, Dr. Kevin Boyd is the real expert in this field. So is Dr. Mariana Evans at University of Pennsylvania. They are looking at kids at six months, okay? And they are able to diagnose breathing issues at six months. They are starting to do treatment with kids who are a couple of years old and they build a foundation um, so that as the kid grows older, their mouth will be large enough to accommodate their teeth to come in straight without braces. Right now we're starting with a poor foundation with a mouth that's too small. So as you grow, you're more susceptible to problems later on. But why not start with that solid foundation to begin with? And then the kid can grow naturally and develop in the way that we were supposed to be developing. And it's, it's not ironic that the models they're using now for mouths are taken from ancient skulls. <laughs> so that's how they're constructing these, these kids and influencing their growth so that they can mimic 
the skulls of our ancestors who had perfectly straight teeth, wide airways, and from what we know, breathed a lot better than we do today. Yeah. And I can, uh, from a clinical perspective, I can also, um, back that up. I have, I would, when I had my brick and mortar practice, I would see, you know, a large percentage of, of peds. I had a lot of a, a pediatric practice, small a pediatric uh, portion of my practice. And what we would already see in like seven and eight year olds was these accessory muscles, like the kind of upper, you know, the scalenes, this, uh, the sternocleidomastoid, which is this big neck flexor already working much harder than they should be. They had this anterior head translation. So their heads were coming forward. And then of course your neck flexors are going to be working much harder than that. No diaphragm, no diaphragm, like diaphragmatic breathing. So I would actually get these kids. We had a little rehab center in the back and I would get them on their backs with their hands on their bellies. And I would say, okay, like you have to, you have to make a little Buddha belly. Like you have to, you know, increase your, like your tummy has to come out like this much. And it was, um, you know, part of the rehab was to actually train, um, train them to start breathing, uh, we'll call it from the lower lobes of the lung with the, with the diaphragm. And I want to, I, I bring this up because I know that I, you know, I've heard you talk about the diaphragm as being this like main pump, right? This main pump in the body. And I thought maybe you could expand on that from your research and what you've seen as well in the literature. Yeah. I just want to uh, make a couple of comments about kids oral posture and their their regular posture it's is sort of devastating what's what's happened and if you look at the work of esther gokel and who who gokle is is how you pronounce that that last name i always get that wrong but she had looked at ancient cultures and looked at how how were these people able to carry 70 pounds on their heads you know, for walking five miles a day whereas most of us can hardly walk around without anything on our heads without feeling back pain. So it starts in early development to develop these proper practices and proper posture is makes it easier to breathe and proper breathing makes it easier to hold proper posture. So both of these things tie into one another. And I think one of the most important things for kids right now is to make sure they're not snoring and, or have sleep apnea and to make sure they're carrying themselves with proper oral posture. And what that means is, the teeth lightly touching or a little bit of space between the teeth and the tongue at the roof of the mouth. When you swallow, the tongue should be at the roof of the mouth. So if you're a kid and you're swallowing this way, you will influence that palate to grow wider. So oral posture is so important to not only how you're going to breathe later on in life, but how your face is going to develop, how you're going to look. And so you can speak to kids vanity uh, if you have to and say, hey, do you want to look like Napoleon Dynamite or do you want to have proper facial structure? Um, so that's that's one thing to do. And then after you get them over that hurdle, you can get into more of the nuances of healthy breathing, which is to use that diaphragm. Uh, you look at any other animal, look at an infant or any other animal in the wild. They're constantly breathing into their bellies. Right. And the way that you can breathe into your belly is to engage the diaphragm, which is this umbrella shaped muscle that sinks down when we take an inhale and rises back up when we exhale. And the diaphragm has so many functions beyond just breathing, but it's, it's essential to use it. And so few of us tend to use diaphragmatic breathing nowadays, even though this is how our bodies really want us to breathe. Yeah. And I would say that's true for my women as well. And, you know, at the risk of not getting you to mansplain, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, exp I'll say it that, you know, a lot of women were, were afraid to, um, soften our bellies. Like we're always kind of sucking it in. Right. But to soften the belly and to allow for that expansion. And I would also say not just uh, from the, uh, anterior, but also the posterior as well. We often forget to breathe in like the diaphragm, as you mentioned, this big umbrella, uh, like muscle, but it expands from the front all the way to the back. So if you're able to expand into the posterior aspect, like when you're breathing, you should have thoracic expansion that all that goes along the sagittal plane, but it should also go along the coronal plane as well. It should also expand front to back as well as side to side. And I think, um, 
for my ladies that are listening, uh, this can be, this can be a challenge because we're always trying to sort of keep it in, hold it in, pull it together. Um, which again, I often, whenever I would x-ray, um, my, it was always like headaches and neck pain. I was like, I I just need to see this neck and the neck for my women, most of the time, more often than not, were either flat. So they didn't have that normal lordotic curve or with my females particularly had more of a sigmoid shape, meaning that the, the normal backward C shape of the neck was actually reversed. So it actually was like a forward C shape, um, because they have been holding themselves in this position, uh, for, for years and years. And of course the body, you know, being the brilliant machine that it is just adapts to what you do. Um, the nice thing about your book though, is that even though you paint this dire picture of the long face, the saggy eyes, the terrible posture, that these things can be reversed. So maybe we can touch a little bit on some of the strategies that you have uh, found to be useful. Again, trying to stay away from the end of one, but things that you have found to be useful, but also from your conversations with pediatric dent from, from the experts in the field in terms of how we can move something that's like unconscious, you know, we have this pattern that, you know, it kind of runs in the background to uh, correcting that to be more aligned with our biology. Yeah. And I couldn't agree with you more that our bodies uh, respond to environmental inputs, whether or not that's nutrition or exercise or how we hold ourselves. So just because we made ourselves sick or, or stooped over, doesn't mean we're stuck with that for the rest of our lives. And that's, you know, what was really driving the research behind this book is all of this negative stuff. It wasn't just to dwell on how far humanity has been removed from nature and how sick we are. That stuff's very depressing. It was to figure out the core problem so that you could figure out durable fixes that can actually work that don't require necessarily pills or powders that you can use your own body to help restore your health. I realize that seems touchy feely, but there's really nothing touchy feely about it. Our bodies are constantly restoring ourselves themselves throughout the day, every single day. And you should make that process easier. You should not make your body have to really work to help restore itself and to keep itself running. So I've found that breathing is, can be such a powerful thing, just as changing your diet can be very powerful. uh, Just as exercise can be very powerful, getting good sleep, just breathing properly. This is how we get most of our energy from our breath, not from food and drink, from our breath. And how you get that energy will determine so much of your athletic ability, your anxiety levels, your mental capacity, and and more. And this isn't my theory. It's not a hypothesis. This is standard validated science. And the good news here is that by adopting some very simple techniques, you can really improve your health. I've seen it time and time again. So let's talk about what some of those techniques might be in terms of, and one of the things I really appreciate about your book is that these are relatively simple and actionable tools that are for the most part, very low cost. Uh, It's not that you have to order this $10,000 breathing machine and technicians and doctors. And there's a lot of, um, as you said, even though it sounds a bit of like, woo, woo, oh, we're going to breathe for our hormones. But like, you know, there's some, there's some real, um, actionable items here. So let's, let's run through a few of them, a few of your favorites in terms of how we can become more aware of our breathing patterns and how we can begin to correct them. Sure. And just, just, I want to double down on what you said about things being woo woo. You can say they're woo woo or not woo woo, but it it all comes down to measurements and it comes down to science. So if something can be measured, it can be studied and if it can be studied, it can be proven right or wrong. And breathing is so easy to measure. It's so easy to measure what happens to your body when you breathe different ways, which is why we found that yes, just changing your breathing can help heal you of several chronic diseases. Sounds crazy. 
The science is there. You can use breathing to heat your body up. Sounds crazy. We can measure this, you know? Um, so one of the first things, if everyone hasn't got this message very clearly by now is shut your mouth. Uh, you need to be an obligate nasal breather. You have to, and I'll, I'll show you why um, I'm going to bring my guest on. He's been waiting patiently, but uh, if, for those listening, I'm holding up a cross section of the human skull. And if you, look at the nose here when you take air into the nose you're forcing it through all of these different structures where it's heated it's pressurized it's conditioned so that by the time it gets to your lungs your lungs can extract about 20 percent more oxygen breathing through your nose than equivalent breaths through the mouth if you look at the mouth here not none of that is there <gasps> that's how hard it is to breathe through the mouth <gasps> That's a problem. You want that pressure. You want that heat. You want that moisture. So breathe through your nose. And I know that's easier said than done. So many people have chronic obstruction issues. You have to figure out a way of clearing your nose. You can do that sometimes with surgery. You can do that with neti pots. You can do that by switching your diet, uh, removing dairy. Everyone's different. I'm not here to offer you a prescription for that, but you have to find a way of becoming a nasal breather. And that is the number one thing. And what about nasal breathing overnight? I think a lot of people will say, oh, I can, I can, you know, become conscious to closing my mouth during the day. Um, some, some people will wake up as you mentioned in your own story that you would wake up with like a sock in your mouth, you know, you wake up and it's like super dry. How do we, when we are in a state of sleep, close, you know, become nasal breathers overnight because we spend, you know, a third of our life, um, in that state. And as you said, if we can be extracting more oxygen, particularly overnight, uh, when our oxygen saturation levels naturally drop in the evening anyway, how can we move towards being nasal breathers in the evening overnight? So, yeah, it is tricky because in the daytime, you're conscious. You can remind yourself to keep your mouth shut. But at night, more than 60% of the population sleeps with an open mouth. Go into the wild and look at any other animal sleeping. How many are sleeping with an open mouth? The answer is none. Some dogs, brachycephalic dogs like bulldogs and pugs that have been bred to have a flat face, just like humans can sleep with an open mouth, but there aren't many of them. So I had this question and I offered it to a few researchers and they mentioned something called sleep taping, which seemed completely insane to me um, that you would tape your mouth at night when you go to sleep to nasal breathe throughout the night. Um, but when I heard it from Dr. Ann Kearney at Stanford, she prescribes it to all her patients. I heard it from Dr. Mark Berhenna. He prescribes it to all of his patients. It has great success with this. I heard it from so many other doctors. I began, began to consider that maybe it wasn't too cuckoo. Um, what this is, I so happen to have a roll of tape right here, is it is just taking a piece of tape. This is how I do it. You can do it whatever way you want. This is surgical tape. And it's about the size of a postage stamp. And you, this is the technology, everybody. That's it. Okay. I can still talk. I can still <clears throat> cough if I want. When I take it off, I take it off with my tongue. The point is not to hermetically seal your mouth shut. This isn't a hostage situation. It's to just remind yourself to keep your mouth shut when you're breathing. And this uh, simple, very very easy task that is basically cost-free. I have found to it completely transform my sleep. And I know this because I track my sleep. And this is the one thing I've heard more than anything else from literally thousands of people who have been doing this and have had such complete transformations in their sleep quality, including reduced or, or completely reversed their snoring and some forms of sleep apnea seems crazy. Stanford's now doing a study with about 200 people with sleep tape and sleep apnea. So hopefully more science will be coming out about this. Well, that was my next question actually is if 
nasal breathing, uh, if one of the mechanistic ways in which we're improving outcomes is the balance of O2 and CO2. So we're taking it, we're warming up the air, we're going through the turbinates, we're toning up the muscles in the back of the mouth, and we're balancing the carbon dioxide to oxygen. Um, and I have some family members who, you know, are complaining of low, t- low testosterone, and they're also, they've been recently prescribed a CPAP machine, which is, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of my, um, one of my fat, he just hates it. Like, he's like, I just feel like Darth Vader. I can't like, I, you know, I'm like swatting at it overnight. And I think that there's, you know, all diseases exist on a continuum. So really happy to hear that there's studies going on around sleep tape and sleep apnea. Is sleep tape another augment? Can it be an, uh, um, something that we can add to someone who needs, I'm not saying take your sleep medicate, like not to do the sleep. You have to have, you know, this has to be done with your primary care provider. And this is a decision that you and your medical doctor need to make. But I would think that all of that oxygen, cause all it is, is it's blowing in oxygen, uh, all night long that you are still kind of missing the mark in that O2 CO2 balance with a CPAP machine. Am I, am I off here or, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, CPAPs are lifesavers for so many people. These, these are amazing machines for people who are suffering from severe sleep apnea, who are literally choking on themselves every night so much so that their oxygen levels sink. And some of these people can choke Uh, you know, 30, 40 times an hour, their O2 levels will drop 10 or 20 points because they're holding their breath and then they go. (laughs) So they're not able to get to these stages of restorative deep sleep, which causes a whole bunch of downstream problems. Who knew that our sleep quality was tied to adult onset diabetes I didn't, but it is. There are direct links between diabetes, Alzheimer's, and sleep apnea. So for these people, CPAPs are are essential to keep them alive. But is a CPAP a good long-term solution? I don't know. I have some opinions about that. Uh, The fact that 50% of people who are given a CPAP, I think it's within two months, won't be using it because they hate it. You have to strap on this terrestrial scuba mask every single night. Um, but I want to be clear for, for quick relief. It is so effective for a long-term solution. I'm not sure some surgery has been shown to be effective. There are a number of different hacks people have used to help reduce their sleep apnea everybody's different. Some people have sleep apnea because they are obese and there is fat occluding their airways. Other people have sleep apnea because they have too many muscles there. Um, So again, I'm not offering any prescription. What I have tried to say in the book is there are some things you can try which are free, which have been shown to be very effective. Incline bed therapy can work. Sleep taping can work for some people. Sleeping on your side, taping a ping pong ball to the back of a t-shirt so you don't sleep on your back has been very successful for some people. And the good news is there are so many wearables now that can track your sleep quality that you can see what is working for you each night and you can develop your own strategy for improving your sleep that way. Yeah. And even, you know, this is uh, in my book, uh, I talk about the benefit of stomach sleeping as a proxy for toning your diaphragm. I mean, one of the, you know, if you have ARDS, if you have acute respiratory distress syndrome, the first line of defense is they flip the patient on their stomach so that they can start getting that diaphragmatic expansion. Um, so that might be something as well. And, and to your, you know, to reiterate what you're saying, you know, you're not recommending people go off their CPAP and neither, neither am I, but I, when I see my family members, they have hormonal, they're complaining of hormonal derangement, uh, you know, low testosterone and, you know, high, high levels of stress, waking up feeling absolutely bagged, even when they're wearing, you know, we call it the Darth Vader mask, but you know, the scuba gear, uh, as you described, I think it's, uh, it's a partial solution. And sometimes we know that 
it's the uh, hypotonia of the tongue. It's like the, the lack of uh, tone in the tongue and the tongue will literally fall back and choke uh, the person as they're, as they're sleeping. So we, um, and part of that is because they're mouth breathing, because when you breathe, you are strengthening these, uh, for these muscles in the, um, in the pharyngeal space that I think will also contribute to better, better outcomes as well. You're absolutely right, which is why some surgeries are now um, uh, removing fat from the tongue. They're going in and chopping the tongue up. It seems to work, but there's, to me, I was like, isn't there an easier way of doing this? And there is, and they are these oral pharyngeal exercises. The tongue is this very powerful muscle that we hardly use now because we're just eating right. so like many soft, it back. <laughs> soft foods. Yeah. If you're chewing for three or four hours a day and every time you swallow, you're thrusting that tongue up to the roof of the mouth, you are widening your airways, you're toning your airway. So it's been very interesting to see several studies on just doing chewing like exercises with the tongue and mouth and seeing how that can significantly cut down on both snoring and sleep apnea. To me, it makes perfect sense. If that's where your sleep apnea is that if, if that's where your obstruction is, then if you tone these airways and get that tongue to rest in a frontward position instead of a backward position, you can really have some marked and measured improvements to your sleep quality and your breathing quality. One of the uh, other, you talked about different types of breath work um, in the book. So we've sort of been talking about how do you just breathe normally day to day? You know, how can we just breathe through our nose uh, during the day at night, uh, reduce some of these, um, these poor outcomes. But you also talk about uh, what I would call more aggressive type of uh, breath work. You talk about Tumo, you talk about um, Wim Hof breathing. Um, why would somebody be assuming that they have their every day, they have that perfect breath that you talk about the 5.5 in the 5.5, like they're breathing through their nose. Everything is, is uh, coming up roses. Why would somebody also be interested in something like a Wim Hof um, type of breath or Tumo or any of some of these other uh, breath uh, techniques that you describe? Mm -hmm. I call these in the book, I call them breathing plus techniques because they're building upon an already good foundation. So you need that good foundation and then you can take your breath and start to really play around with it. Um, you can use it to help improve athletic performance. You can use it to help reduce asthma. You can use it to heat your body up all this fun, weird stuff, but it really starts with that foundation. And that foundation is the same whether or not you're an asthmatic or an ultra marathoner or a kid or an adult, you should always be breathing in this certain way, which is, or often as you can breathe in a certain way, which is through the nose, slowly, lightly, deeply. It seems so simple. How many of us breathe this way? Very few of us. Once you do that and acclimate your body to doing this, you can use your breath to have a lot of fun and, and do a bunch of, of very interesting things um, that can allow you to move up that next level of human potential. And what I mean by that is uh, people like Wim Hof, who have demonstrated that he can be shot up with the endotoxin version of E. coli and breathe in a certain way to fight off this endotoxin and not suffer from any symptoms. You can talk about tumor breathers that can breathe in a certain way and increase the temperature in their fingers and toes by 17 degrees. They can be wrapped in a wet sheet and 45 minutes later, have that sheet completely dry when they are left in a cold room. So all of this stuff. So I don't view this over breathing or you call it aggressive breathing as counter to the slow, deep and light breathing. I view it as complementary because breathing can do different things for us at different times. But again, it's important to have that foundation down first. And then you can start playing with your breath. So Wim Hof method, uh, he's made this over breathing, this hyperventilation breathing quite famous. I know Wim, amazing guy. It's amazing what he's done for so many hundreds of thousands of people help improve their health with this breathing. But these techniques have been around for thousands of years. And he's the first to admit that. And they're just 
the Wim Hof method is just one of several other hyperventilation techniques that have been around forever that in scientific studies have been shown to have a massive and transformative effect to our health, especially for anxiety and panic and autoimmune issues. Yeah. One of the, one of the interesting things, um, I was reading was that there were, you could predict whether someone was going to have a panic attack, uh, you know, was it up to an hour before because of the changing um, levels of, uh, can you explain a little bit about that and what were some of the therapeutic interventions there? Sure. So I was talking with, with some neuropsychologists and psychiatrists, and they had been focusing on breathing and they had seen in so many of their patients, especially patients with anxiety, anxiety disorders, with fear-based disorders, even anorexia, asthma, they tend to overbreathe. And they were measuring their CO2 and found that their CO2 levels were very low. And the reason is, is they have assumed that people have adopted these breathing techniques because they're so scared of holding their breath. Asthmatics associate holding their breath, with having an asthma attack when they have all that constriction, they can't breathe. Panic sufferers associate it with the same thing. What happens when you panic? <sighs> You breathe, 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 breathe. You feel that constriction and then you have the sense that you can't breathe. So they've convinced themselves if they're constantly breathing too much, that that is the space where they're comfortable. And when you breathe too much, you tend to offload too much CO2. So which is why these people are so sensitive to CO2. When you ask them to hold their breath for five seconds or 10 seconds, a lot of them will have an attack. They'll have an extremely negative reaction. So what several researchers have been doing for the past several decades is they've been training people with panic and with anxiety disorders and asthma to breathe more slowly, to become acclimated to having more CO2 in their bodies. And the study you're, refer you're referring to, which was done about 10 years ago by Alicia Moret at Southern Methodist University, she was watching the CO2 of people with panic and asthma, and she noticed people with panic, their breathing would change, they would breathe more rapidly, they would offload too much CO2 uh, an hour before they had a panic attack. So once she saw that, she could alert them, it's like, hey, something's going on here. You need to slow your breathing down. And this was incredibly effective. About 68% of those patients, two months after the study, were no longer having any panic attacks just by using their breathing, slowing down their breathing. I think that that's useful information, even if you're just checking emails, <laughs> you know, sometimes Anytime. you get a yeah. text message, you're like, ah, <laughs> you know, like the, 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 I think the initial, you know, response is to be, to, is to, is to guard, is to hold your breath and to sort of brace for impact. So I think it's, it's good advice to, to be in those moments, to become more aware of what's happening with your breathing. And, um, in the book, you talk about the perfect breath, which is five, 0.5 seconds in and then 5.5 second, five seconds out. Um, sometimes it's called uh, coherent breathing, uh, resonant breathing. Um, for someone who's trying to, you know, type A personalities uh, like myself, who are trying to say, okay, I want to, I want to, you know, adopt this, this perfect breath. Um, the idea I'm assuming, and you can maybe expand on this, would be to start, maybe 5.5 is going to be too much for most people. It might be too uh, aggressive. What might you, you know, if there's a sort of a, uh, a template for people to adopt this perfect breathing, what would you, what might you recommend? Sure. So, you know, a lot of Westerners type A sorts uh, want to go in once they learn something and uh, with breathing, they just want to kick their breath's ass <laughs> zero, yes. zero to 100 in a single session. Guilty. Yeah. Don't do this. Please don't do this with breathing. <laughs> your lungs aren't going to be happy. Your diaphragm's not going to be happy. Your intercostals aren't going to be happy. This should be a very gradual and soft and relaxing process. So with the 5.5, that has been shown in studies to be the perfect breath. I've gotten into a lot of trouble since I wrote that because so many people have written me and said, you know, I'm 
uh, measuring my breath and uh, I, I get it down to five seconds or six seconds, but I can't get that half second and it's driving me crazy and I'm not breathing the proper way because I ha- can't get that half second. I said, oh my God, what, what have I done? So I'm revising the book to say around <laughs> five to six seconds in, around five to six seconds out. For people who are taller, for people who are over around 6'1 or 6'2, you can extend that because you have larger lungs, right? You have more space for your diaphragm. You can extend that to be maybe seven, eight, or nine seconds in, seven, eight, or nine seconds out. Ballpark is just fine, everybody, okay? And when you breathe this way, if you have a heart rate variability monitor that is allowing you to see your HRV in real time, you are going to be fascinated by this. Because when you breathe this certain way, something amazing happens to the body is your respiration ties in with your heart rate and all of these different systems of the body work in coherence with one another, which is peak efficiency, which is why your blood pressure goes down, which is why your heart rate goes down, which is why you feel this sense of complete and utter calm. This is not a placebo effect. This is your body humming along at peak efficiency. And who doesn't want peak efficiency? Everybody wants peak efficiency, which is why this coherent or resonant breathing has been used and has been seen to be so effective for people with anxieties, for people with depression. Dr. Richard Brown at Columbia has used it for 20 years and has found it to be such a powerful intervention for all of those issues. Yeah. And it's, it's about, it's about activating your parasympathetic nervous system. I think that that's really mechanistically what it comes down to because you can't, so many of us in this modern and just pandemic, you know, and pandemic to endemic, all the things that are always changing. It's a very stressful, uh, existence right now. And I think, um, even before the pandemic, I, you know, the women that I would counsel, the patients that I would see very much stuck in sympathetics, very much their sympathetic tone would take over. It's very easy for the bot, for the brain to live, you know, to live in your amygdala and your li- your sort of lower systems in the brain. And over time, I have noticed that it becomes harder. So these, you know, these cohorts, these populations that you like the anxious, uh, you know, uh, depressed, uh, prone to panic attacks. It's, it's that inability in some cases to detach from the sympathetics and move into that parasympathetic rest, digest, stay and play, uh, sort of nervous system. Um, so what I, what I think you're saying is so, um, it's so paramount and it's so simple and elegant at the same time because it's available to everybody. And when you are enacting the parasympathetic, you know, it's like our immune system gets better. Our reproduction gets better. Our cognition gets better. Everything improves when we're in that state. I mean, you just nailed it with that. And a lot of us have been told that in order to get to that relaxed state, we need to go to a spa. We need to change our diet and diet does, does help. We need to do all of these things that can take a lot of time. And some of them can take a lot of money, but what we haven't been reminded of is that breathing is by far the quickest and most powerful way to shift your states. Dr. Andrew Huberman down at Stanford, I've talked with him several times. He has been studying something called a physiological sigh. And he is, he believes that this is by far the most powerful way of shifting yourself from stress to relaxation. And this is all it is. You take two breaths, one on top of the other through the nose and you exhale, you can exhale through the nose or through the mouth for this exercise. It doesn't matter. And just doing this there's a separate subsect in our brains that controls sign. We can take control of that subsect of neurons in our brains by breathing this way. And when we do this, We immediately shift the state. Just doing that two times calmed me down so much. I needed a second to sort of regain my my abilities here. But this is something when you feel stress coming on, someone cuts you off in traffic, you get an email from your boss and he's being a real jerk. 
breathe this way three or four times to reset before you do any other action. And I think you're going to find it to be very effective and it's free and it's available to you at any time. I have enjoyed this conversation so much. Uh, it's been so such a pleasure nerding out with you. Um, if obviously we're going to have the link uh, in the show notes uh, for the book, but if there's uh, any other resources for people that you would like to direct them to, whether it's um, something that you offer or other uh, research that you have found to be uh, interesting, where can I? Well, where can I realize I that my, some of the science here may sound shaky or strange, uh, which is why my publisher allowed me to put my entire bibliography of the book for, up for free on my website, including videos and data sheets. And there are about 400 scientific nice. references mm -hmm. there. I've also included interviews with professors at Harvard and other leading institutions talking about breathing. There's free exercises as well at mrjamesnester.com. You can put a backslash breath in there to go directly to that portal. I'm also trying to get better at this social media thing, which for an old guy is mystifying, but uh, at Instagram is mystifying, but uh, at Instagram, I'm just posting things related to the science of breathing and other things that I'm working on in, in my research, including quick tips from experts in the field. And that's at Mr. James Nestor, MR James Nestor, because somebody else took James Nestor. And so I had to put an MR there. <laughs> right. so, so well, there we'll, make, we'll make sure that those are all in the show notes. And I just want to thank you for your research. Uh, I really enjoyed this book. Um, I'm, I know that my listeners are going to get so much value from our conversation today as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much.